All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another ePrime live stream. My name is Devin Struthers. I'm the training coordinator for Psychology Software Tools, and today we have a really cool webinar for you guys today. So what we're going to do today is actually something that a user requested. Uh, one of our users reached out to us and said, hey, I'd really like to see a working memory task. So guess what? We're doing a working memory task today. So today's task is actually based on a study from 2005 by Vogel, McCullough, and Machizawa. Um, I apologize if I mispronounce any of those names. Um, so their study actually consists of three different experiments, and today we're going to be building experiment one from their study. Now, um, I read through the study. It's a great study, and um, I actually ended up making the sample a little bit beforehand, and it's really kind of cool. So um, the way that this works is participants are shown for 100 milliseconds. They're shown an array of images. Um, these images contain squares of differing orientations um, in different rotations, so either uh, a vertical square or horizontal square or one at a 45 degree angle. They're told to only focus on the red ones, on the red squares, and between um, showing them at first and then they're going to be shown these squares again and there is a possibility that one of these squares might be rotated in any other way. So it's, um, its rotation or orientation may have changed between its first presentation and second presentation. And the job of the participant is to determine whether any of the given targets um, on either the right or left side of the screen, and you're told on a per trial basis which one uh, you're focusing on, um, is to determine whether or not one of these targets has actually changed any of its rotation between presentations of the image. So it's actually a really cool study. It seems like it's going to be pretty tricky. And there are kind of two approaches to do this study uh, in E-Prime. Uh, because you know in E-Prime, there's always a couple ways to do everything. There are kind of two approaches. The first one is to have E-Prime do this all programmatically. And if you're familiar with any of our um, extensions products, specifically E-Prime extensions for Toby, we have a really great sample in there called Varying Position AOI and Varying Position AOI Tracking. Those actually demonstrate how you would do this programmatically. So how you'd make E-Prime determine the positioning and the rotation of the objects on the screen. What we don't show is the other way to do it, the, uh, the way to kind of, it's a little bit more work up front, but it's less work in the, in the long run. So um, that's the way that I'm going to demonstrate today because it's kind of a novel take on how we demonstrate how to do this task. So, you know, if you're following along at home and you're like, man, you know, his images seem very specific or, you know, these types of things or I can think of a different way to do this. Know that my approach to this task is because it's a way that we really haven't demonstrated in E-Prime before. So I'm kind of showing you the other side of the E-Prime coin, so to speak. So the way that I took was I actually made a lot of different images beforehand of the different configurations of these objects, and we're going to uh, randomize the way that they're shown. And um, while I was making this task, I came up with a fun little nickname for it. Um, I just call it Fun with Attribute References, because the way that this is going to work today is we're going to actually use a lot of attribute references in a lot of really unique and interesting ways to kind of display these images that we have and to make sure that they're displayed randomly and to make sure that they're displayed um, you know, in the right trials. So you know, if we have participants focusing on the left-hand side of the screen for a trial, for example, um, I don't accidentally throw in a condition where um, they're supposed to have seen a change when they didn't see a change or the change happened on the wrong side of the screen and stuff like that. And this is really what my, or this way of doing it kind of mitigates. It mitigates the risk of if you have everything completely randomized, how do you control things without a massive amount of inline script? And this actually shows the way to do that. So I'm going <laughs> to go ahead and stop talking about how we're going to do it and we'll jump right in. So the first thing I want to do is show off some of the images that I had made. So um, I actually have this this folder here, and these are going to be included in the experiment library afterwards as well. So if, as you can see here, here are all the images I have, and I have a lot of them. So I have two different configurations of stimuli. I have four target stimuli and two target stimuli. And um, just through reading the paper, experiment number one toggles between either four target or two target presentations of stimuli. Um, and the target stimuli that we're focusing on are red squares on the screen or red rectangles. And I'll show you an example of one of my two target ones just because they'll be, uh, they'll be probably the easiest to, to look at here. So here we have a fixation cross in the middle of the screen. This is actually going to be covered up whenever we run the experiment, and I'll show you about that a little later. But we have different orientations of both red and blue, um, both red and blue uh, 
rectangles, basically, and they're both on different sides of this uh, of this fixation cross here. So now the reason I have this set up like this is because um, participants are going to say, okay, our participants are going to be told, focus on only the targets on the left side of the screen or only the targets on the right side of the screen. And I've made these images generic enough and they all change in different ways. So I have this first configuration and then if I go to my next one, this is configuration uh, 1B, where if you look here on the left hand side of the screen, this one changes orientation. So it goes from being completely horizontal to completely vertical, but nothing else on the screen changes. And then if I go to my configuration C, you'll notice that um, that they change again. So this image right here, or this one changes on the right side of the screen. So this is going to represent our, um, our instance where we're focusing on the right side of the screen and when that one changes. So I have just different versions of these tasks. So here's our original image, here's when only the left side changes, and then here's when only the right side changes right there. So this is kind of how I have every single one of these. So if you look at, I'll do my stim config 2, very different configuration of images. And again, I have everything changed there. Stim 3, another different configuration. So I have all of these images with these different targets and distractors. So the targets are the red ones, the distractors are the, the orientation of the blue ones. And then I have three different versions of these pictures. I have what I call my A configuration. My A configuration is what participants will see first. I have my B configuration and my B configuration. Um, and when I say A and B and C like this, um, what I mean is literally just if you look after here, I have four stim config five A, B, and C. So there are three different versions of this config five. Um, I have three different configurations. A is that first one, B is when only the left side of the screen changes, and C is when there's a change in orientation on the right side of the screen. Now, these names look a little wordy. Uh, there's four stim config, two stim config, um, and then a number, and then A, B, or C. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because I'm actually going to encode these in E-Prime in a pretty cool way, and I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. Um, because I want to make these as randomized as possible, but the other thing that I'm doing here is I'm also going to be building this experiment to be expanded upon, because um, the main reason that I want to do this to be expanded upon is because, like I said, uh, the study itself actually contains three experiments, and I'm only building the first one today. So I'm building this experiment in a way that allows you to very easily manipulate the rest of, or the experiment to show the rest of the conditions, or to show the other two experiments uh, once you make those files. So um, I, I made these in very in these in very specific ways. So I have my two stem configurations. I also have, if you notice here, my four stim configurations. So these are definitely a lot busier. So there's, you know, there are four targets on each side of the screen here. Orientation of one will change. So these are definitely a lot harder conditions. And we're going to be randomly presenting either two or four to participants. And keep in mind here that I also have a left arrow and a right arrow that I had made. I actually just made these in Microsoft Paint, but they look pretty good. So. I'm going to be using these in my uh, in my experiment today. So let's go ahead and jump right into ePrime here. So the first thing I'm going to do in ePrime is I'm actually going to pick a blank template as I always do. I just like to start from scratch. So I'm going to go ahead and just click cancel. You can also choose a blank template if you want. That's entirely up to you. But for now, let's just go for a blank template here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first add a welcome screen, as I do to all of my tasks. Um, now this welcome screen is going to be a little bit more verbose than a lot of our other welcome screens. And the reason I say that is because um, this, there's a lot of instructions involved with this one. So I'm going to go ahead and take a text display, and I'm going to make it the first object in my experimental timeline here. And I just grabbed it from my toolbox and put it in the session proc at the very beginning. I'm going to go ahead and rename this one just to welcome and hit enter. And then go ahead and double click on it to open it in the workspace. Now, just going to write a very quick, simple message at the beginning. So, just welcome to the experiment. And now I'm going to actually go into what they'll be doing in the task. You will be shown a series of shapes at different points in rotation. I'll say point points in rotation. There we go. Your job is to identify if the rotation 
of any of the objects changes between you know what I'm actually gonna say any of the red objects just to cue them into red between presentations of the images there we go and then you will also be shown an arrow that lets you know what side of the screen you are to focus on. If an image, oh, let's say if a red image on the side of the screen as indicated by the arrow changes orientation and I'll just put in parentheses here rotation just to make it clear rotation press 1 on the keyboard I'll actually, I'll actually say press 2 on the keyboard we'll do 2 for uh, a 2 on the keyboard for a change condition and if they stay the same we'll have them press 1 all of the red images on the side of the screen as indicated by the arrow remain the same orientation rotation press 1 on the keyboard and then press space to begin so I made those a little more verbose than I do a lot of my other instructions um, some of my other instructions if you followed along with these live streams are pretty basic they're basically just you know Hey, welcome to experiment. Push buttons. Let's go. Um, this one is a little bit more involved because there's a couple of different things I have to keep in mind, whether they're watching the right side or the left side of the screen, and they need to know that they're only focusing on the red objects. So now that I have all my text on the screen here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this properties page icon in the upper left-hand corner. And I'm going to focus specifically on this duration input tab, and I'm going to change the duration of this object from 1,000 milliseconds, which is definitely not enough time to read all of this text, to infinite, just so it can stay on for as long as participants need. Um, I want to change my data logging here to standard. Um, you can keep it standard. You can keep it time audit only. That's actually up to you. Um, I do like to see the participants press the space button sometimes. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and click add, add a keyboard input mask, because participants will be responding with the keyboard and I'm going to change my allowable to space. That way participants can only press the space bar whenever they're on this, uh, this text display object and they can't use any other key in order to advance. If I want to, I can set space as correct or as my correct answer as well, but I mean since space is the only way they can advance from here, there isn't really much of a need to, to put anything incorrect there. So I'm going to go ahead and click apply and OK to save these changes. And uh, if it ever takes a second after you hit apply, it's because it's actually going into data logging and it's checking all of these checkboxes for data logging. So if you ever wonder what kind of data you're logging based on these, you know, these, you know, somewhat vague definitions of data logging here, if you hop into logging tab, what it'll do is it'll tell you exactly what's being logged and it even does a good job of telling you exactly what it means. So what does ACC mean? What does CREST mean? What does REST mean? those types of things. It actually tells you exactly what you're getting there. So it's a really handy tab if you ever want to control what kind of data you're getting from any object. All right, so now that I have my welcome screen done, the, net, uh, the rest of the task is actually going to be pretty easy. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my list object and I'm going to drag it just after my welcome list. Now, like every task that I make, this is going to have a block level list object. And for those of you who are following along you know, for the first time to one of these, it's going to seem a little silly that I'm going to have this empty block list object. Um, like I said, this is kind of meant to be the building block for the other two experiments. So this is where you would add them in, is in this object. And if you need more instructions on this or anything, please feel free to send me an email, comment on the video, anything like that. Um, and if anyone is following along today and has any questions about anything I do or would like me to slow down or speed up, by all means, feel free to leave me a comment in the live chat. I am always happy to answer any questions you have. All right, so the, after we've added our list one, I'm going to go ahead and rename this one. And I said this was going to be a block level list object, so let's change its name to match that. So I'm going to call this one block list. And I'm going to hit enter there. 
So the reason I call it block list is because it's block level list object. And I know that it's a block level list object because if I click on my experiment object at the top there, or at the top of the experiment explorer window and click on data file, you'll see that the very top uppermost level is session level. And I'll be making an entirely new level called a block level. And it is the next one down. And then the one after that is obviously called trial. And we'll be making that one as well. Um, and just a fun fact about this, um, there are two really cool features on this tab that I think um, are almost criminally underutilized. Uh, the first one is this create a tab delimited copy of the data file. Um, I'm going to log that for this one, um, and it'll be in the example as well. But what the tab delimited copy of the data file allows you to do is it allows you to um, import the, the data file directly into Excel or um, another type of program without having to open up eData8 first. Uh, now keep in mind that this is only for our users with a full license of ePrime and aren't running either a runtime or subject station version. So if you have a full version of ePrime on the computer, this will definitely do that, and it's a really handy feature. Otherwise, um, otherwise, you know, it's it won't work if you have a runtime license. Uh, and then the other one is this data file name. If you ever wanted to customize the naming of your data file and you don't want it experiment dash subject dash uh, session, and you wanted it to be something else, you can definitely put that right here. Uh, and that's you know, its name is entirely up to you. Just keep in mind that every um, experiment needs to have some semblance of an attribute reference in there, uh, just so we can actually you know increment the the data file on a per subject basis or a per participant basis. Otherwise, it'll just be the same data file overwriting itself for every participant, and that's not great. Okay, so now that I've made my block list, I'm going to go ahead and double click on it to open it. And I'm going to go ahead and make a new procedure. Now my procedure is going to be called block proc. And the reason I'm calling it block proc is because it is the procedure coming off of the block list. And that's kind of how we're going to be naming a lot of things here. So what I did there is I typed the word block proc and hit enter. And I kind of entered through these kind of quickly. But uh, the first prompt I got was that the procedure called block proc doesn't exist when I like to create it. And I hit enter to, to click yes. Um, that says, would you like to make pr this procedure the default value for newly created levels? I'm going to click no. In general, I don't click yes to that prompt on the block level or in my block list. And I don't do that because this block list is really where you want to change procedures and you want to have procedures kind of differ. So the block list is where you're going to decide whether or not you have a practice block or you have a critical block. Or in this case, my block proc is going to represent experiment one in that study that I had mentioned. And if you want to add in experiment two and experiment three into this data file or into this um, into this file here, you would add a new level and then that new procedure would represent experiment two and then one more would represent experiment three. So block list really does a lot of work um, and is, is one of the major, you know, kind of driving forces behind the experiment flow um, if you actually set it up that way. All right, so in our block proc here, what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to make a list object. Now this list object is going to do a lot more work than our block proc did. Uh, this is actually going to control all of the independent variables in our experiment. And when I nicknamed this task fun with attribute references, this is where that happens too. So I'm going to take a list object and I'm going to put it in my block proc, block proc here as the first item. And I'm going to rename this one to trial list. And I'm going to hit enter here. So I'm going to double click on it because I want to start actually adding my independent variables. So the procedure is first just going to be trial proc. Again, same naming scheme as the first one. Um, doesn't exist. Would I like to create it? I'm going to click yes. Would I like it to make the or would I like to make this a default value for newly created levels? I'm going to say yes because we are going to have a couple of new levels that we're going to add to this trial list object to represent the different uh, the different types of stimuli that we're going to show. And I just want this procedure column to automatically fill itself in whenever I hit. Um, this add level, you see that it auto fills right there. So it's automatically trial proc, and that's exactly what I want. All right, so the first important thing that I want to put in my list object is whether or not on this trial participants want to focus on either the left or the right side of the screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and make an attribute here called, um, or I'm just going to add an attribute by clicking that add attribute button. And this one's going to be called trial direction. Now, this trial direction is going to have two values, either left or right. Do left, and I'll do right. So now that I have my trial direction, um, this is going to show up on a per trial basis because, like I said, each one of these rows in a list object actually represents a single trial for E prime. 
So then after I have my trial direction, the next thing I want to do is I want to add stim number. Now this is going to represent whether or not I'm displaying two stimuli or four stimuli in this trial. Now if I fill it out one way, and I'll show you if I do this, if I do uh, two stim and four stim, this is going to end up being a problem whenever I make this in, whenever I run this. Now the reason this is going to be a problem is because my trial direction is set to left and my stim number is set to two stim and that means that they're never in this instance in this configuration here they're never going to receive a trial where they're looking at the right side of the screen and they're only two stimuli to look at now I spent a lot of time making those files I'm really proud of them and would really really like them to all be used to their best um, you know all be used to their fullest so I don't necessarily like this where it's left with two stim and right with only four stim so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add two new levels and I could either add them by clicking on add level twice or click on add multiple levels and then type two in what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually delete this right here and I'm going to type left and then I'm going to type right twice so then I'm going to go ahead and vary this so now I have two stim and four stim and if you can see as I was typing um, E prime tried to autofill for me it works kind of like Excel's autofill does where it sees you start to type something and it says oh great I see you're typing this this is probably what you mean which in most instances is extremely helpful alright so now my trial direction and I have my stim number there so I'm gonna have four trials total right now I'm going to have two left trials one for two stim one for four stim two right one for two stim and one for four stim so now that I have these, I want to go ahead and add my images that I have. So if you notice, I have these images in a very, very specific format. I have um, this config number, which, or sorry, this, uh, this stim number, which happens to line up exactly with what I'm calling it here, uh, config, and then a number, and then um, either, either A, B, or C at the end. So what I want to do is I want to make an attribute here that's going to utilize all of those parts and I'm going to call this one first image. All right, so I'm going to expand that because this is going to be a little big. But what I want to do is I want to first make an attribute reference to this stim number because if you notice, these are all called either four stim or two stim right here. So um, these are going to just autofill into either four stim or two stim. So I'm going to call this one stim number, and it's just going to get that value from this um, from this attribute row here. Um, I could fill these in manually, but like I said, I wanted to kind of do this so you can easily expand upon this for all of your other experiments. So I'm going to make this an attribute reference so you can change between these. So do stim number, and then the next part of my file name here for all of my file names here is the word config. So I'm going to actually hard code that one in. So I just do config. And then now I need my number. So if you look here, I have um, config one, A, B, and C, config two, A, B, and C, um, I have three, all the way up to nine. So I go from one to nine on these. Now what I could do is I can do config one, a.jpg, and then stim number config 2.jpg and go all the way down the list like that. And what that's going to do is that's going to make this list exponentially larger. Um, it's actually going to be a rather big and complex and really difficult to work with list. So what I want to do is something a little more clever, and this is some more fun with attribute references, is I want to do something, or I want to make something called a nested list object. Now what a nested list object is going to be a list that's within this list, and I'm going to set the nested list to random. So then on a per trial basis, E prime is going to randomly draw one of these numbers uh, from one of my config numbers, so from one to nine. That way there's no real discernible order to either the participant or to E prime as to which number is going to show up. It'll just be completely random. So each of these configurations are going to be randomized uh, in and of themselves. So to do that, to make a nested list, all you have to do is just type the name of a list object that you want in this nested um, in this nested column here. So I'm just going to call this one config list because it's a list object that'll contain all of my configurations. And I'm going to hit enter. Now, when you hit enter on anything in there, it says config list doesn't exist. Would you like to create it? Of course, I would. And that's it. So. Now I'm going to go into my config list and 
just a list object, I don't want to associate a procedure with this config list because the procedure is going to end up being trial proc. This is just another pool of stimuli. It's kind of easiest for a lot of people to think of it as a pool of stimuli to choose from. And I'm actually just going to call this attribute or make an attribute in here called config number. Now my config number is obviously going to be one through nine because I have one through nine on my first four stim and I have one through nine on my two stim. So this one is just going to be one through nine. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put one in for the first one and I'm going to add eight levels to this attribute. And I'm just going to fill in the rest. So I have one, two, three, whoops, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. There we go. Now the only other change that I need to make to this list object is if you look here, it's set to sequential selection. So that means it's just gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine in this order. So I'm gonna get, you know, I'm gonna get stim number config one A, stim number um, config two A, I'm gonna get that in that order. And that's not what I want. I want you prime to randomize all of these. So to do that, I'm actually going to click on this properties page icon click on the selection tab and change my order from sequential to random. Now there is an option here if you'd like to change the order from random uh, to random with replacement. Um, and what that does uh, is the way that random works is if uh, my is if E prime chooses config number one, it can't choose config number one again until it works its way through all of the rest of the configurations. Um, it'll choose config one, then it'll choose config eight, then four, and every time it chooses one, it doesn't add it to the list of possible selectors or possible um, possible configurations to be selected. Now, if you want tr what I call true randomization, um, you would go ahead and turn on that random with replacement, and what it'll do is once it's selected, let's say configuration number two, it has an equal chance of selecting configuration two again. So in the most extreme random conditions, I could have an experiment that only runs configuration number two back and forth the entire time, but honestly, if that ever happens, you should probably play the lottery that day because that is the luckiest, most insane thing I've ever seen. But just know that that's an option if you would like that one. Um, if that's how you want your randomization to work. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna keep this just at random selection. I'm gonna have it reset sampling after nine samples. So after it's worked its way through all nine, it's going to cycle back if it needs more, re-randomize, and then pick from those nine again. So now that I have my configuration list made, and especially that config number, let's go ahead and add it to this, uh, this first image attribute that I'm making here. So config, and then I fill this in with config number. There we go. And then if you notice, I am filling in the rest of it with either A, B, or C. And since A is going to be our kind of base image, all of our first images are going to be that A.jpg. And all I do to fill in the rest is just take this little fill handle here. There we go, and drag and drop. So now, regardless of my two stim or four stim or my direction of left and right, I'm going to fill this in with um, stim number config config number A. Because the first image I show is always going to be that A image. And then the B and the C represent either a change on the left or right hand side. Now the only thing that I need to change um, about what I have here is this nested list. And this is something that's actually a little bit overlooked by users who have nested lists. Is I have my nested list, I have my config list all filled out here but every trial isn't going to get this the, um, the information from this list object. In fact, once I hit trial two, I'm actually going to get an error and it's going to say no such attribute configuration number. And this is where a lot of the users and some first time E-Prime users as well, um, even first time tech consultants here sometimes, uh, me when I started out, um, will actually run into an error here that says uh, attribute not found config number or no such attribute. And you know, initial reaction is to go, but it's in config list. It's right here. I see it. Why isn't it there? The reason it's not there is because you need to reference this nested list on every single trial. So every one of these needs to have this config list in it. Otherwise, it doesn't have access to that config number and you will get errors. So what I need to do is all I did there was I just copied by highlighting this row and clicking control C and then I just pasted with control V down the line. 
and then now every single row of my list object will have access to that config list. And so this is also helpful too if you have some trials, and we won't in this experiment, but if you're making your own, and you have some trials that you don't want to reference this list, you want to reference something else, just simply delete it from this row here, and then put in with the other, net or the other nested list that you wanted to reference. But we're going to keep config list there. All right, so the next thing we want to do is we want to make a another uh, another attribute reference or another attribute here for the second image. Now the second image is what participants are actually going to be responding to. This is going to be the one with either the change or the no change. Now this one is going to be a little bit different because it needs to reference this left and this right right here. So I'm going to have an instance um, here, uh, so for left, this is going to determine what this uh, what this letter is at the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy these two and I'm going to put them over here in this second image, just to save me from having to type all of that out. Now, if you remember my naming scheme for the objects, uh, the trial direction is left. So if this is going to be a change condition, the left hand side of the screen is going to have to change neither two or four. So what I want to do is I want to change this A at the end to the B. Because, again, if you remember my naming scheme, uh, all of the B images are where the, the trial on the left changes, or the, the image on the left changes. So then, if these are going to be a right condition, I want this to be my C ones. So now I have two where the left, the I have two trials here, one and two, where the image on the left changes on either two or four, and then I have two where the image on the right changes, either two or four. Now the only thing I don't have yet are trials where nothing changes between two or four and trials that are left or right. So that's why this list is going to grow just a little bit bigger because I need to vary between trial direction left and right and whether it's two stem or four stem, so I need to go ahead and add more rows. So go ahead and take my config list, and I'll bring that down with me because I'll need reference to that as well. This is going to be a left trial for two stim. And the first image is going to be the A image, and the second image is going to be the A image, which means it's not a change trial. So then I need to copy this one for my four stim. So I can actually just copy these entire three entries here instead of having to type them out like that. I just take my cursor and literally I'm holding down the uh, just the click button or the left button on the mouse and highlight those three, hit control C and then control V. So now I have my left four stem and then I have uh, config A and then all I do is hit control C and paste again. So now I have my left images so I just need my right conditions now. So I need to go ahead and add two more and I'm actually just going to copy these four or these, or these six cells there and then paste them in and I just did top left it'll paste them in automatically and then I just need to copy these into here and bring my config list down if you bring your cursor to the bottom right hand corner of any cell it'll uh, give you a little fill handle here and you can just drag and drop and it'll fill in whatever you want so now I have an entire cross section of all of my different possibilities I have four possibilities here for whether or not it's the same condition, so whether or not anything changes, and then I have my four changes here and how they're going to actually map out, so my B conditions and my C conditions right there. So that looks to be exactly what we want. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually just going to change how this is selected. So I have my config list actually set to randomize, and I want this to randomize too. I don't want two stem, then four stem, then two stem, then four stem, then two stem, then four stem, because that's gonna get really repetitive and participants are actually going to catch on, and I want that to be something that's a little bit more surprising. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that properties page right there and go to selection, and I wanna change my order here to random as well. Um, and again, you have the option of random with replacement. If you so choose, I'm going to select random. Um, and I'm going to change my reset exit because right now I only have eight samples and that's not a very good study. Uh, if you actually read up on this study, I think participants have about 100 to 105 samples that they're choosing from. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm actually just going to have it cycle this list a couple of times and I'm, I'll call it 12 times. We'll get to 96 so it'll be really close. So now participants have 96 
um, 96 trials to run. And all I did was just change that number on this reset exit. Now, in the study, um, from reading it, it sounded like they had everything presented with equal randomization. Um, there wasn't any one trial that was weighted more than the other, but if you do end up wanting um, any sort of change conditions, so let's say left side conditions to run more than the right side ones or anything like that, you can actually just change the weight of these objects. So now um, E prime has to go through two of these, um, two of this condition and two of this condition in order to run through the entire list, which is why you saw the number of samples really, really grow there when I added that. But um, I'm going to keep everything the same right here. All right, so now that we edited our list object, everything else is pretty comparatively easy because all we're doing is taking all of this work that we've done and just applying it. Um, actually, before we go, there is one more attribute I want to make, and this is actually going to be pretty important. Um, it's actually going to be something called correct response. Because if you remember before, um, in my welcome screen here, I said I want participants to press 2 if the arrows change orientation, and I want them to press 1 if the arrows do not change orientation. So in my trial list here, I want to make this correct response attribute. And the first couple here are going to be the arrows changing orientation. So everything with a B or C at the end, so 2. And every time where they don't change orientation, I'm actually just going to um, add a 1 here. So now I have my correct response. So now that we have everything all set up, and actually set up real this time, uh, I'm going to go ahead and make the trials, which I said are going to be comparatively pretty simple. So I'm going to go ahead and close all of these here. I'm going to go into my trial proc here. Now the first thing I want to do is I want to make my queue object, and this is just going to be a simple fixation cross in the middle of the screen, but the important part is I'm going to reference um, what trial they're supposed to be looking at. Is this a left trial or a right trial? So I'm going to take a slide object here, and I'm going to go ahead and rename this to just Q. And I'm going to double click on it to open it in the workspace. Now the first thing I want to do is make that fixation plus in the middle of the screen. So I'm going to take a slide text sub object and I'm just going to add it anywhere really because I'm going to change its orientation a little later or not orientation but position on the screen and I'm going to go ahead and delete the word text from it and you do that just by double clicking on it uh, and I'm just going to add a very simple fixation plus. And if you click away from it, it'll actually snap to the center of the object like that. So what I want to do is I want to make sure this is in the dead center of the screen, because one of the most important aspects of this task is that this uh, fixation cross actually shows up in the center of the screen the entire time, because this is what's going to give participants the orientation between right or stimuli on the right and stimuli on the left. And it's really important that these things are there. So what I want to do is I want to go into the properties page of the sub-object itself, not of the slide object. And to do that, I'm going to go ahead and click on this sub-object's properties page. I'm going to go over to the frame tab here, and I'm going to change the position from 48 and 50% to center and center, and click apply and OK. Now, I'm doing um, center and center instead of 50% or pixel value, because that's going to kind of come into play a little later, because we want a couple of these objects to be on the screen. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to load in one of these arrows that I have. And right here I have a left arrow and I have a right arrow. And I want these to actually show up over top of the queue object. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a slide image. And I'm going to put it right about there. I'm going to resize it just a little bit. And I'm going to make sure that along the x-axis at least it is in the center of the screen. So I'm going to click on the sub-object properties page button and I'm going to click on frame here and X is in fact in center, Y is 30%, that's perfect. So now I need to reference those arrows, or those arrow images that I have. And I'm going to call this left arrow or right arrow. And what I want to do, because I want to actually line these arrows up with the correct trial type, is if I look in here in my trial list, I already have left and right saved as trial direction. So to reference this image, what I'm going to do is click on it, click on its properties page, and then I'm going to type trial direction, and then a close bracket, and then the word arrow.jpg. So what this is going to do is it's actually going to resolve the word trial direction. So it'll resolve that to either left or right, and then it's going to do what we call concatenating, or kind of tagging onto the end, the word arrow.jpg. So now it'll reference either left or right arrow, and since E prime and list objects kind of grabs everything on the same row, it's going to reference the correct arrow per condition, or 
per trial. Um, I am going to go ahead and change the stretch property yes, just so I make sure that, or just so we know that the arrow fits exactly within this area here. And also what I'm going to do, so now that I'm actually re uh, referencing images, I'm going to click save here. Now the reason I'm going to click save is, here we go, um, I already have a version of the working memory task that I'm going to upload there later, so I'm just going to call this one working memory live stream. So the reason I'm actually saving it is because E-Prime, in order to get images like this, and in order to just reference them without having me to, or without me needing to put in the entire path of the image itself, is it needs a reference point. And the reference point in this case is the exact folder in which this is saved. Now, if I want to just in E-Prime make things look nice and neat and clean, instead of having to go, you know, C users Devin desktop or you know put in a full pathway like that and just have to reference that image name um, it needs to these images need to be in the same folder as the ES3 file so that's why I wanted to save before I reference this image so now eprime knows to look in the same folder as itself to find this image all right so now I have my queue set up so the next thing I have is my first memory array so I'm going to go ahead and take that slide object and I'm going to put it just after my queue and I'm just going to rename this one to memory, memory array. I'm going to double click on it to open it. Now this one's going to be a lot simpler. So what I'm going to do is take this slide image and I'm going to put it here. I'm actually going to resize it so it's pretty big. I'm going to make it 95% of the screen height and same for width. Now I'm doing 95% uh, instead of 100% just because the area around these images here, if you look, it's all a white image. So um, it's going to you know, be like a white image on the side and there isn't any border and I'm not gonna put a border around it so it's just gonna look like that same image ex extends to the rest of it. But I want it to also maintain its aspect ratio. I'm gonna change the uh, X and Y position here to center and I am going to set stretch property to yes. Now this is something that you'll have to change or mess around with a little bit if you're trying to run this at a different resolution than I am. Um, you might run into an instance where the image appears kind of stretched or distorted or something like that. If that's the case, or if it's you know pixelated, you may want to set it to no if you're running at a higher resolution. It might end up making those images look a little crisp and a little more clear if they're um, if you're displaying this at a different resolution. Otherwise, I'm going to select yes to ensure that my image that I load it makes or takes up this entire uh, area here. Because, you know, I for this task, at least for this part of the task, it's more important that this image appears um, unstra or the image appears on the correct left and right side of the screen. Now, my file name property here I'm going to click OK quick. My file name property here is just this first image attribute that I had made. Notice I even put a .jpg at the end there. So for file name, I just simply fill in an attribute reference for first image. And then now what I wanted to do is, like I said, um, some of my images have those little um, have those little fixation points here on them. So you see that fixation there. Now the problem that you might see between these is that the fixation point on some of these actually ends up moving. Uh, and that's not ideal because we need that fixation point in the center to be exact because that's, like I said, the important part and it's going to tell us whether or not it's going to be on the right or left. So um, the actual uh, version of this or these images that are or this being uploaded to the experiment library doesn't actually include those fixation crosses specifically to get around that problem. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take a text display object and I'm going to put it on top of my image display object and I'm going to just fill this in with that very simple plus sign. And I want to resize this just so it doesn't accidentally overlap any of the images that are actually on the screen or the important parts of it. And I just want to change the frame here so it is center and center for that X and Y position. So now the effect that we're going to get is this is going to cover up those slightly misaligned uh, the slightly misaligned fixation points that we have, but it's going to make sure that it lines up exactly with the queue or with what's on queue and everything else to come. So that's actually going to be one of the most important things that we do here is put that that uh, 
you know, that little uh, text display or slide text sub object over top of this. And this also goes into something pretty cool that we have in EEPROM with slide objects called Z order. Um, and this is something not a lot of people know about, but you can actually layer images and things on top of each other on a slide object, and you can change the order that they're shown in just by clicking on this order tab, and you can either uh, bring things to the front or send things to the back. It works a lot like, uh, if you're working with PowerPoint maybe, it works a lot like that. All right, so now according to the study, I need to go ahead and change the duration here. Uh, the duration for this by default is 1,000 milliseconds, but according to our study here, it's only shown for 100 milliseconds. So this is a pretty tough task. I'm going to go ahead and change our data logging here for time audit only. Uh, we can do standard, you can do time audit only. Um, basically, the rule of thumb is I'd like more data than less data, so I save data for everything. And then that's all we need to do for our memory array. So the next thing we're going to do is just a very simple fixation cross in the center of the screen. This is actually our retention interval for our task. Now the retention interval is literally just, you know, you saw it, try to hold this into your short-term memory because you're going to see something change, or you might see something change. So I'm going to take a slide object, and I'm going to put it just after my memory array. I could technically do a text display object if I wanted to. I'm going to go ahead and rename this just to retention interval. Now I'm naming them these things just so in the data file it's very obvious what you're looking at. So whenever you look at the duration of this object, it's obvious that you're looking at the duration of the retention interval, and it's easy to kind of map to what the study says. All right, and I'm going to take a slide text sub object, and I'm going to just add a very simple fixation cross. And at this point, we should be very familiar with this. Uh, go to that slide sub object properties page, click on frame, set X and Y to center right there and we're good. And I'm going to go ahead and click on this properties page icon, change my duration. Now the retention interval in this task is actually 900 milliseconds, so I'm going to change it to 900, and I'm going to change my data logging to time audit only. And I'm going to go ahead and click apply, wait for it to log all that data, and click OK. And I'm going to save this task very quickly because I am making a lot of progress on this now. Alright, so I'm going to close out of all of these because I don't, I don't really like a lot of clutter up there. It's strictly personal preference, by the way. You can have as many objects on here as you want. Go ahead and close all of those. And under my trial proc, I'm going to add my last object, which is going to be my test array. So I'm going to go ahead and rename this just to test array. And hit enter. So now my test array is going to be that second image that I have, and something is either going to change or not change depending on the condition. And this is also the object to which participants respond. So I'm going to go ahead and click on adding a slide image. This is going to look extremely similar to my memory array. I'm going to click on the sub-object properties. My file name for this one is second image. I am going to set stretch to yes. And I'm going to change my frame here to center and center. Oh, and my height and width are going to be 95%. And then one of the fun things to do in E-Prime is to move this over and click Apply, and you can watch that change. All right, so now that I have that image, what I want to do is I want to add that fixation to the center of the screen again. I'm going to go ahead and shrink that. Now what I can do is I can do this, or I can hop into my memory array here, highlight that, and then if you hit Control-V, it'll actually paste the object. Now, the reason I want to paste the object from my memory array into my test array is because I want to make sure that the size of this object remains the same and remains consistent between uh, these two objects. So if I actually go into its properties page now, you can see that all the properties I set, so the X and Y align, or the X position and Y position there, and the height and width of this object remain the same between the two objects. And again, I'm putting a lot of emphasis on the fact that this fixation point needs to be in the center of the screen and needs to be consistent just because you know we are determining right or left side of the screen by this fixation point. And it's also kind of a cool effect to have that fixation point in the center and then have the screen kind of change around it. So now that I have the visual components of this object set up, let's go ahead and set up the behind the scenes stuff. So how participants are responding, how long they have, those types of things. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this properties page icon here and I'm going to click on the duration input tab and I'm going to change my duration to 2000 milliseconds. 
I'm going to change my data logging right now to standard and I'm going to add a keyboard input mask um, just because participants are responding uh, through the keyboard and I'm going to change my allowable here to 1 and 2 um, it looks like 12 is the allowable. It's actually one or two. Uh, we actually don't delimit things in E-Prime when it comes to allowable here. So there's no need to put in a comma like I did. Um, I've seen people try to use a semicolon or a colon. Um, the only way you input allowable keys is just putting them next to each other here. But now my correct is actually going to be a reference to the attribute that I made in my trial list called correct response. There we go. I'm going to hit apply, and since I'm logging standard data, it's going to take a second. I'm going to click OK. And that's really all I need to do for my test array. So now E-Prime is going to run through this trial list 96 times, um, and it's going to configure different letters and different numbers for here. So everything should be pretty good. Now the only thing I want to add to my experiment at the very end is I like to add a goodbye slide. So I'm going to take a text display object and put it just after my block list here. Now the reason I go into my session proc to do this and don't put it under test array is because if I put my goodbye object under test array, it's going to run every single time. So all of my 96 trials are going to say thank you for participating and then go into another trial. Um, which, I mean, I guess is kind of positive reinforcement, thanking them for doing it every trial, but it kind of defeats the purpose of it. So if I go on my session proc here, and add my goodbye object as the last object here, what'll happen is E-Prime is gonna run into my goodbye, or my welcome object. It'll go to my block list, and then it'll go from block list all the way down the line. So it'll go block list, and then trial list, and then it'll run through my trials and kind of loop through those. And then once those are all looped, it'll hit my goodbye object. So we can go ahead and rename this one just to goodbye. Double click on it to open it in the workspace, and it's a very simple goodbye message. So thank you very much for your participation. Please, and I'll spell please right. There we go. Let the researcher know you are done. And then this is only going to show up by default for five or for 1,000 milliseconds. I'm going to change my data logging to time audit only just to make sure that it ran. I'm going to click apply, and then I'm going to click OK. I'm going to go ahead and save this because that is all I need. So now I should have everything set up correctly. So let's go ahead and see if I can do a test run of this one. Um, we weren't actually able to do a test run earlier this week when I was doing my Cyberball task. So um, if you don't see anything on the screen or if it looks a little distorted, um, know that it's how we're feeding things into this video so or this, uh, this live streaming software. Go ahead and run this. Can you see those? All right, cool. It looks like you can see those. So I'm going to go ahead and click end space here and that little arrow came up. So what I'm getting here is an error called no such error first image, or no such attribute first image. And the way to troubleshoot errors like this, and you know, if you know I purposely load these things with errors, um, I have my memory array slide image dot file name. And it's actually getting the value of an attribute called first image. So what I need to do, and, and what I need to do first is look where it's telling me to look. So it's telling me to look in my memory array, and specifically that slide image dot file name. So let's go into my memory array here and look at my slide image and the dot file name property. It is called first image. So let's go into my trial list. And if you look here, I actually have a typo. So that's where this error is coming from because I'm referencing first image here and I know I set my first image on this trial list. And if you look here, I have a typo. So let's go ahead and change that. So it now says first image. So let's go ahead and run again. So that's actually one of the, the hardest things to pick up about E-Prime is where to start whenever you get errors like this. And it's really easy to get overwhelmed if you have something that's a lot big or a little big or a little complex like this, especially when you've kind of complex um, stimuli. E-Prime always tells you where to look whenever you're doing um, error checking like that. All right, so it looks like that showed up again. All right, so then there's that error. So I'm gonna get another one. So now it says, file name, 2 stim config 6 ajpg So it says that it is unable to load this image file. And this is my memory array slide. So it's 2 stim config 6 ajpg So I look in my memory array. It says unable to load this image. And it tells me exactly what image it is trying to load. 
So it's trying to load that config six. Where was that one? And also this debug print tab at the bottom here, this generate tab, this is also where that error gets saved. So specifically, it's trying to look here in two error for config or two stem config A. So if I go into my file name here, I try to find two stem config six A. And there we go, I have my B and C, and this is something else to bring up. So for my two stem ones, I actually don't have my A here. Um, I have just config six. And this is another point that I wanted to bring up. And this is why I actually didn't add these, is because E-Prime isn't very smart and isn't very adaptive when it comes to file names. Um, E-Prime doesn't really know what you're talking about when you load a file name into E-Prime. It just looks for exactly the file name that you specify and says, can I find this? Yes or no. Um, and this actually makes loading file names into E-Prime a little bit, um, not cumbersome, but a little bit uh, specific. So for example, I was missing my A after that image. And if I look in here, that was actually something that I purposely didn't add to these image names. Just to show you that, hey, E-Prime is going to look for that exact image name. Now it's also important too, because you can get this error message, even if you have an extra space either before or after the image name as well. So I made this one kind of obvious. I was actually missing the entire A from all of my two stim, uh, my two stim conditions. But if you look here, if I were to go ahead and change this file name and put a space like right here, you probably wouldn't be able to find that file because I actually have a space before the file name. And it's the same with afterwards. If I were to put it, woof, don't do that. If I were to put a space after the file name, it, e prime would actually crash and say this file doesn't exist either. Well, not crash, it'd give you that runtime error and say this file doesn't exist either because there isn't that space after the file name. So, you know, I, I used kind of a, a big, very obvious example here, but this is also important to keep in mind if you have an experiment with all of these images in here, you need to make sure that you are maintaining absolute perfect consistency between what these image names are and how you're referencing them in E-Prime. So let's go ahead and run this one more time. Let me make sure you guys are actually seeing this too. As you can see, I just blow through the startup info prompts. I clearly don't care that much about this data. There's that arrow. All right, so you guys saw that first one. And then right now I'm getting a factor error for uh, no such attribute correct response. And that's actually in my test array dot input mask. And let's go ahead and check my trial list here. And as you can see, I misspelled this one as well. That one is legitimately an error. That one's my bad. There we go. Like I said, I usually try to pack a couple errors into here um, just to show you guys some of the troubleshooting steps that we take. Um, just to show you guys how you can troubleshoot too. That one was actually my bad. All right, so there's that instruction screen and it looks like you guys aren't seeing that. Sorry about that. So um, one of the beauties of windowed mode is if you're ever running anything on windowed mode and things aren't working out like it does now, I'm gonna go ahead and click exit and it actually just exits the experiment for you. So it's a nice way to kind of pause the experiment in the middle of it. So let's try this one more time just to see if you guys can see this one. If you can't, then, I mean, like I said, this is going to be in the experiment library. Go ahead and load it from the experiment library and um, you can run it yourself. Okay, cool, looks like they're seeing that. Hit space, there's that right arrow. And then see if there was a change. And as you can see here, our fixation cross stays in the very middle of the screen. That is exactly what we want. That memory array shows up incredibly fast. All right. Yes, this task is looking pretty good. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and pause it right there and go ahead and exit out of these. There we go. And there you have it. We have experiment one of the working memory task from Vogel McCullough and Makizawa.
thank you guys very much uh, for attending. We have two webinars coming up next week as well. Uh, we have one on Tuesday at 10.30 a.m. We have one on Thursday at 10.30 a.m. as well. So please feel free to tune into those. If you like what you saw today and would like me to keep doing more of these, feel free to like and subscribe to our channel. Like I said, that really helps us out. Uh, if you watched our last YouTube video, um, I mentioned how uh, YouTube kind of changed its algorithm. So those subscriptions and likes are actually a little more important now, which is kind of weird. Thanks, YouTube, I guess. Um, but you know, definitely feel, you know, definitely like and subscribe if you have any comments or any ideas for studies that you'd like to see. If you're really struggling with an E-prime study yourself and you'd really like to see me do one of these live or you know, see how you know, I would have done it as opposed to how you did it, uh, feel free to leave a comment on the video. If you're following along and have any questions, go ahead and leave us a comment on the video too. And if you're really struggling with one of the experiments or have any questions about any other experiments, feel free to go to support.pstnet.com. That's our product service and support site, and we are always happy to help. So, yeah, thank you guys very much, and have a great day.